The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled RCC Masterclass and Clinical Consult, Remodeling the Treatment Algorithm with Novel Immune and Targeted Therapies, featuring Dr. Tony K. Schwery from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Robert J. Mozer from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and Dr. Sumantra Kumar Pal from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, California. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash QEY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to RCC Masterclass and Clinical Consult, Remodeling the Treatment Algorithm with Novel Immune and Targeted Therapies. I'm Dr. Tony Schwery from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And I'm pleased to welcome my colleagues, Dr. Bob Modzer from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and Dr. Monty Pal from City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in California. So um, in the program now directly, I wanna welcome you uh, overall. And uh, today's agenda is going to be around uh, the current state, the most updated states during the GU Cancer Symposium in February 2021, as of this symposium, what's the current state of frontline immune and target treatment option in advanced RCC by Dr. Modzer. Then we're gonna have an update about later line management in this disease with the potential for novel modalities on the horizon. And all along, we'll have some case discussion and cover some updates from the 2021 GU Cancer Symposium. First, before introducing Dr. Mozer, I wanted to provide one slide about the approved first-line combination therapies in advanced RCC as of today. Overall, we can think about several classes of agents, CTLA-4 inhibitors, PD-1 and PDL one inhibitor, VEGFR, TKI, and actually mTOR uh, inhibitor. But mostly in the first line are the CTLA-4, the PD-1, PDL one and the VEGFR uh, TKI. We have ipilimumab and nivolumab, the combination of dual checkpoint inhibitor, which is approved by the FDA for poor risk and intermediate risk IMDC criteria based on the Checkmate 214. And now we have a three VEGF IO combination, two combination with axetinib, axetinib plus pembrolizumab, the PD-1 inhibitor that was based on Keynote 426 trials. In all risk group, the combination of axetinib plus the PDL1 inhibitor, avilumab, also approved in all IMDC risk group. And finally, just a couple of weeks ago in January, the combination of the PD1 inhibitor nivolumab and the TKI cabozentinib, again in all risk group, based on the Checkmate 90R that was presented at the 2020 ESMO meeting. Without further ado, I want to introduce my uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Bob Modzer from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Modzer has been involved in the majority of the clinical trial that defined how we treat uh, kidney cancer. It's a pleasure and honor him, an honor to welcome him. Bob? Hello, this is uh, Bob Mozer, and uh, th thank you so much for that introduction and for uh, providing me the opportunity to participate in this program. We're, we're going to review the, uh, the first line treatment for uh, RCC. There's been uh, so much progress and change in the last uh, few years, and this will provide an update of that, uh, those changes and all the progress we're making in this area. Um, the first trial that really brought IO into first-line therapy was the Checkmate 214 trial, which was a, um, a randomized trial of ipinevo versus sunitinib in the first-line therapy for patients with clear cell RCC. The co-primary endpoints were, were PFS, OS, and objective response rate in the intermediate and poor risk group. And secondary endpoints uh, were similar outcomes in the uh, ITT group, which included uh, the favorable risk patients. So uh, this is the outcome uh, for this uh, trial. And in the um, uh, primary endpoints in, in response rate and uh, 
overall survival were met at the uh, at the primary analysis, showing a benefit for Nevo plus <laughs> IPI over sunitinib. What uh, the primary endpoint for progression-free survival was was not met at that uh, at that first analysis. There was a strong trend in favor for Nevo plus IPI. Uh, this trial has benefited from the longest follow-up, uh, most recently uh, reported with the 48-month uh, medium follow-up. And uh, it's shown over time that the uh, results for uh, Nevo plus IPI have been sustained with regard to a um, benefit in survival. Uh, and what we've seen over time is that the, uh, the progression-free survival uh, remains uh, uh, longer than sunitinib, and in point of fact, it's been leveling off, and so there seems to be a real sustained benefit from uh, Nevo plus IPI uh, in progression-free survival as well as overall survival. The uh, overall survival and the, uh, and the progression-free survival were most recently reported at the 48-month uh, follow-up metric. The results are shown here. Uh, there's a strong benefit and overall survival in this population for Nevo plus IPI over sunitinib. And in our right panel, uh, you can see the progression-free survival and that important kind of tail at the end of the curve where there's a, uh, the, the PFS is being maintained in a fairly large proportion of patients who are treated. And, and that both of these, uh, the, the overall survival and the that maintain the progression-free survival really are the strengths of uh, ipinevo as a treatment and first-line therapy RCC. It seems to be most pronounced in this intermediate and poor risk group. Uh, as far as response, the objective response rate uh, was about 40% in, uh, in, in the ITT group. Um, a little higher than that in the intermediate and poor risk group. Uh, and you can see from here that the response rate was lower initially in the favorable risk group with about 29.6% uh, of patients responding. But there was actually a, you know, a, a um, was a surprise to many of us that the, uh, the response rate was actually higher in the favorable risk group than in the, uh, for sunitinib compared to ipinevo. It was a reverse of what we had seen in intermediate and poor risk patients. One of the, uh, the strengths, however, uh, with ipinevo again, is that there are complete responses that are seen. And um, the complete response rate overall for the ITT group of patients was 11%. Uh, and you can see in the favorable risk group, although the response rate is higher with sunitinib compared to nevo plus ipi, the CR proportion is actually higher with uh, the nevo plus ipi at, at, at 12%. So, uh, and the responses are ongoing with Nevo plus IPI. So the, the strength is the, uh, the, the benefit in survival, the long progression-free survival with that tail at the end of the curve showing sustained benefit and this complete responses that are uh, seen with Nevo plus IPI. Uh, and the one uh, you know, caveat to that is that actually in a favorable risk group, the, res the overall objective response rate is actually higher with a TKI compared to IPI Nevo. Durable responses are uh, noteworthy for uh, uh, NEVO plus IPI. Uh, here we can see the uh, duration of response for the ITT population, uh, for the intermediate and poorest population, which was the primary group that were assessed in this trial, and uh, as well as in the uh, favorable risk population. And so we see these sustained responses with IPI NEVO over a long period of time. And what's interesting is that in the, uh, in the favorable risk group, uh, although the response rate is less, you can see that the responses are more durable with Nevo plus IPI. So fewer responses, but when they occur, they're very durable. And that's, that is a hallmark and a, uh, a real positive aspect of Nevo plus IPI in first line treatment. One of the other features that characterizes uh, Nevo plus IPI is that the, uh, the benefit for treatment uh, carries on after therapy is discontinued. Uh, so on this uh, swimmer's plot, we see that we see uh, complete responses 
uh, and they remain durable, durable complete responses associated with this program. And we also see some other responses uh, that uh, uh, complete responses that when treatment is stopped, the, the response is ongoing. And so this is another notable aspect of NEVO plus IPI and that responses are ongoing and appear to be durable even though treatment has been discontinued. The other uh, real area of progress uh, and interest in terms of recent uh, studies are for the uh, TKI IO combinations. And uh, here we show uh, 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 a number of these different trials that compared IOTKI to uh, sinitinib in first line therapy for RCC. We'll look at the data here closely. Uh, Pembro plus Exitinib, uh, the Keynote 426 trial, certainly noteworthy. Uh, with PFNOS as primary endpoints, its, it's uh, outcome really changed the standard of care as well in first line therapy for RCC. The PDL1 inhibitor, atezolizumab plus bevazimumab, uh, met its primary endpoint in progressive pre survival by investigator assessment in PDL1 positive patients, but uh, did not show benefit other in overall survival uh, and is not being pursued or was registered for general use. As well, the PDL inhibitor of Elumab plus Exitinib showed a benefit in PFS and PDL1 positive group in the ITT group, but is yet not shown overall survival. Most recently, the exciting data, which we'll review in detail in the 9ER with NEVO plus CABO, showing benefit in PFS as well as the secondary endpoint overall survival. And uh, the uh, most recent splash at GU ASCO was for that CLEAR trial, which was a three arm trial comparing Levatinib Pembro versus Levatinib Everlime, as, uh, uh, both of these versus Sinitinib. And the trial that is really, in my opinion, the, the highest priority of, of most interest ongoing in first-line therapy is the COSMIC-313, which compares uh, cabozantinib uh, plus nevo-ipi versus placebo plus nevo-ipi. So let's look at the data a little bit more closely. This is the schema for the Keynote 426 phase three trial. Previously untreated patients uh, with clear cell component, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to Pembro plus Axi versus Sinitinib. Co-primary endpoints were overall survival and uh, progression-free survival. And uh, this was reached at the, uh, the, the first interim analysis with a medium follow-up of 12.8 uh, months. And um, this is a uh, slide that shows the overall survival in the ITT population, uh, showing early separation of the curves and a statistically significant benefit for Pembro plus Axi uh, compared to uh, Sinitinib. Uh, this slide here represents uh, the first of the, uh, the follow-ups after the uh, result of the primary analysis that was presented by Betsy Plimick at, at, at our ASCO meeting. Progression-free survival as well uh, prolonged for Pembro plus Axi uh, compared to Sinitinib from this update uh, by Betsy Plimick uh, with the minimum follow-up of 23 months. Uh, one of the notable aspects of this is that um, the, the PFS, the medium PFS is really quite long 15.4 months with Pembro plus Axi. We don't yet see that kind of leveling off with uh, prolonged treatment uh, or stabilization, uh, you know, uh, later on and in, in, in with longer follow-up that we've seen plus Nevo plus Ipi. And, and that is uh, an aspect of TKI IO therapy that we're carefully monitoring, uh, looking for a, a, a similar sort of sustained benefit that we see with Ipi plus Nevo. Response rates were higher with Pembro plus Axi compared to Sinitinib. One of the certainly the strengths of IOTKI combinations shown here with Pembro plus Axi is the high objective response rate of 60% here. The complete response rate uh, was a little lower in this study than in Ipinevo, but it's very difficult to make cross study comparisons. But one of the other uh, uh, salient points 
with um, TKI IL combinations as shown here with Axipembro is the very few people that actually progress as their, uh, as their, their, their uh, best response. So um, it's, it's almost like a benefit is, is almost like guaranteed with uh, this particular combination. And it may be a choice for those people with rapidly progressive disease who may run into trouble if they don't get a response very early on. The, um, at, at ASCO, the, um, the outcomes following two years of treatment were uh, progressed, at, uh, at, were, were presented by Betsy Plimick. Here's a summary of the uh, results here. And this was of uh, the, uh, the, the patients who were treated with Axi plus Pembro who completed two years of treatment, uh, what was you know, their status and uh, what we can see is that uh, the survival very long for these patients, uh, the PFS very long as well, response rate very high, 85% uh, with a 14% CR. So the, this highlights the fact that, that there's a significant proportion of patients in the Pembro plus Axi arm who completed two years of the Pembro and are really doing extraordinarily well uh, with longer follow-up. The Javelin Renal 101 trial was a phase three study that compared Evalumab plus Exitinib to uh, Sinitinib in first-line therapy for RCC. In this trial, the, the co-primary endpoints were PFS and OS in the pdl one positive population. And uh, the results uh, are shown here uh, from updated uh, data that was presented uh, by Dr. Shuari uh, uh, recently, and it shows that the progression-free survival was longer for Avalumab plus Exitinib compared to Sinitinib uh, in that pdl one positive group with a median PFS of about 13.8 months, and this reached statistical significance. Checkmate 9ER uh, was, a, um, uh, was a trial that compared Cabonevo uh, to Sinitinib in the first line setting. The primary endpoint was PFS and key secondary endpoints were survival and response. Uh, this was presented uh, by Dr. Shuari at the, the ESMO meeting in the uh, fall. And um, the results of uh, this study for PFS are shown here with a benefit in uh, progression-free survival for Nevo plus Cabo compared to Sinitinib. The median PFS was 16.6 months uh, with the, uh, the combination compared to 8.3 months with Sinitinib with a very powerful hazard ratio of 0 0.51 in benefit for the uh, combination. Survival as well uh, was uh, longer with Nevo plus Cabo uh, versus Sinitinib reaching statistical significance and showing a strong benefit in this combination for uh, uh, Nevo plus Cabo over Sinitinib. Also another really a kind of a landmark study that will impact on our standard of care. In keeping with the IOTKI combinations, the objective response rate was, uh, was very high with uh, uh, Nevo plus Campbell, 55.7% as uh, shown here, double that that we've seen with uh, Sinitinib. Uh, as well, there's very few patients, uh, less than 6% that had progression disease as their, uh, their, their first uh, or their best response. Again, uh, highlighting the fact that, you know, response is, there's almost a guarantee of some degree of benefit in starting uh, this particular program in patients with first line therapy for RCC and a, a good choice for those with very aggressive disease. Um, we recently updated these results with, uh, with longer follow-up at the uh, ASCO GU meeting. Uh, the results of this, uh, this update with an additional six month follow up from the original presentation at ESMO show that the benefit in progression free survival is, uh, is being sustained. 
uh, as well as the response rate and the overall survival. In addition, we looked at the, uh, the particular patients with that had sarcomatoid histology, which has traditionally been a group that, with a very aggressive uh, course of poor prognosis. And uh, in this population, the, uh, the, the relative benefit with Nevo plus Cavo over Sunitinib is really amplified, uh, indicating that this group has a particularly in, in, inflammatory underlying biology and seems to respond particularly well to IO combinations and uh, as well as in combination with, uh, with CABO plus NEVO. The uh, CLEAR trial was uh, reported for the very first time at GEOASCO. And this was a, uh, a three-arm trial that compared um, lymvatinib plus everolimus to sunitinib and lymvatinib plus pembrolizumab to sunitinib. Uh, and this uh, trial, the primary endpoint was PFS, but key secondary endpoints were objective response rate and survival. So they, um, there was um, more than 1,200 patients that were treated on this trial, uh, and the, um, the outcome uh, showed that the, there was a benefit in, in progression-free survival in both the lymvatinib Pembro arm and the levatinib everolimus arm compared to sunitinib. Here you can see the median PFS is 24 months, which is the longest that we've reported to date in any of these uh, IO combination first line trials for lymvatinib plus Pembro. And it reached statistical significance with a very powerful hazard ratio of 0 0.39. There was also a benefit in lymvatinib everolimus with a median PFS of uh, 15 months compared to nine months with sunitinib and the hazard ratio 0 0.65. Uh, and so the, the kind of the first thing you can see is that they, while they both met their primary endpoints, there seems to be a larger benefit uh, with lymvatinib plus Pembro than with lymvatinib everolimus. Median overall survival not reached uh, in either of the arms, but uh, there was a statistically significant benefit in overall survival with lymvatinib plus Pembro compared to sunitinib. The hazard ratio was 0 0.66 and the p-value was 0 0.0049. The, uh, this was not observed with the lymvatinib everolimus arm. In the lymvatinib everolimus arm, uh, the hazard ratio was 1.15, so the, the, uh, in its comparison to sunitinib. So benefit in PFS for both of these lymvatinib-based arms, more uh, uh, of a uh, degree of benefit for lymvatinib plus Pembro, and the distinguishing factor appears to be that the lymvatinib IO combination shows a benefit in, uh, in overall survival, but not lymvatinib everolimus. Response rate is shown here, and the uh, response rate with lymvatinib plus Pembro was 71%, uh, which uh, again was double that we saw with sunitinib, very high objective response rate. Similarly, the response rate was higher with lymvatinib plus everolimus, although not to the same degree. And what was notable as, as well in this trial was the 16% complete response rate uh, that was seen by independent review in this trial compared to only 4% with sunitinib. The, uh, this ha highly active combination is characterized by uh, by uh, durable responses as well, uh, or I should say responses of long duration, and the median duration of response was 26 months with lymvatinib plus Pembro uh, compared to only 15 months with sunitinib. So the um, key takeaways for these trials are that uh, for, uh, for dual immunotherapy with uh, IPI plus Nevo, showed a strong benefit in the intermediate and porous patients meeting its primary endpoint. It's characterized by durable responses with a long follow-up now. And uh, there does appear to be a continued benefit once treatment is stopped. There is a relatively higher uh, uh, immune-related adverse event rate requiring uh, steroids uh, in 
Um, uh, some patients treated with IPI plus Anivo. Uh, and so the adverse event profile is really uh, a me immune mediated uh, adverse events with that, that predominate. With uh, immunotherapy plus VEGF or TKI treatments, uh, there was a benefit in, in response rate and PFS seen in a favorable risk group. Uh, uh, there was also improved PFS response and overall survival for Pembro plus Axi, for Nevo plus Cabo and, uh, and Pembro plus Lumbatinib, all showing the uh, survival benefit. We don't yet have the mature follow-up that we do with the ipi nevo trial, um, but there does appear to be a lower rate of immune-related side effects. Um, the, uh, the side effect profile for these combinations is really driven by the TKI, and so there are more uh, chronic side effects that need to be dealt with for patients treated with these programs. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Mozer. Um, for this uh, presentation. This is the most up-to-date um, presentation, I would say, or information um, out of GU ASCO that put the first-line combinations into um, you know, a framework, how we can treat our patient. Now let's look at a case and focus how we might work with patient to talk about combination treatment option, whether IO, IO, or IO VEGF, and at the same time, manage safety consideration while they are on a different treatment. So let's take the case of Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson is a 55 year old man with uh, known to have stage three renal cell cancer. Um, his uh, tumor was removed after a radical nephrectomy and was followed with surveillance imaging studies. And after 18 months, uh, imaging showed two enlarging lung nodule, one in each Long. Overall, the IMDC criteria were looked at, and uh, Mr. Johnson was IMDC favorable. His um, lab uh, variables were all um, okay, his performance status was fine, and he was classified as favorable uh, risk. So, given the recent data, I would like to ask you, what do you think when discussing combination therapy option with Mr. Uh, Johnson? How do you uh, handle overlapping uh, toxicity? Um, and uh, these are some principles for addressing overlapping toxicity with IO plus TKI regimen in uh, renal cell cancer. I'm going to ask Dr. Mozer, what does he think about this, and if this is a framework that he follows in general. Bob? So um, I think the, you know, the favorable risk group is really kind of the, the most controversial group in terms of choosing appropriate therapy. Uh, uh, an argument can be made um, for um, uh, TKI IO combinations, certainly with the uh, with a long progression-free survival, even in this particular subgroup, the higher response rate compared to TKI, um, the survival has been, this, you know, has not been uh, a separator between those two. But they, you know, they've been relatively small groups and uh, in a subset analysis. So there are certainly IOT com IOTKI combinations are a good choice in the favorable risk uh, group. Uh, but they, uh, there has to be a discussion with the uh, patient in terms of the, the use of the, uh, the, the com combination of IO over TKI alone. And also certainly uh, uh, Ipinevo is, uh, is uh, an option as well in this particular group based on the CRs and the durable response. For the most part with the IO TKI combinations, the, uh, the toxicity is driven by the TKI I do think that there is there there is some sort of an exacerbation of some of the toxicities uh, by the addition of the IO component, uh, and um, I think that skin toxicity for some of these uh, IO TKI combinations are seen to a higher degree than with the TKI by itself. Um, we always look at overlapping toxicities uh, with combinations, and uh, those. Uh, 
are generally the most worrisome in the combination need to be the monitored closest because they can be additive or synergistic. And um, with these IOTKI combinations, probably the, you know, the, the, the overlapping toxicity that is um, seen the most frequently is either diarrhea and GI issues or hepatic uh, toxicity. And um, so I think it's a bit of an art in terms of, um, of uh, distinguishing the two, particularly the GI toxicity. For the most part, the, the, uh, the, the uh, GI toxicity that we see with TKIs like cabozantinib and exitinib uh, is diarrhea. And with the, um, with the IO uh, treatments, the main concern are uh, colitis and uh, and ileitis. And so they have different presenting symptoms. With uh, colitis, there's more of a, a, a cramping abdominal pain feature. And with the TKIs, it's more of a straightforward diarrhea. And so I think that one is to kind of characterize the component as to, you know, which component we think is responsible and then manage that component. So if, uh, if it's pure diarrhea, we generally give modium, or, or we hold the exetinib or the cabozantinib, consider dose reduction. If there's a concern that it's related to the IO component, then generally I oftentimes have the patient undergo a sigmoidoscopy to look for inflammatory changes and the treatment is, is different. It's withholding the IO and sometimes using steroids. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Mozer. I um, fully agree with that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to present like a couple of uh, minutes here. Um, uh, cry for help, help you if you want to encourage patient to report uh, adverse event early. This is um, patient advocacy group, the KC Cure. Um, and in a survey here with the KC Cure, the Kidney Cancer Research Alliance of over 1,100 patients with uh, advanced RCC. Uh, and it's not surprising to see that the responders reported they often waited until their next appointment to report uh, adverse event. And when we start thinking about, uh, you know, two drugs, VEGFIO or IOIO, and uh, maybe in the future, uh, three drugs, I think this is a, a, a problem. And, um, you know, a significant uh, number of patients here, a percentage, um, you know, do not report uh, the adverse event on time and wait for their next uh, uh, appointment. And I think it's important uh, to know these. These are the patient voice and what the patient says. Now, a, an audience question here that I'm going to take um, the liberty to answer. Uh, do we see any difference in patient quality of life between the different IO plus TKI regimen? And I would say that Dr. Mozer, in his previous explanation, you know, discussed that a bit in terms of touching base on uh, the adverse event. But I would say here, when we look at quality of life and patient reported outcome, this is the voice of the patients. And many of our phase three trial now uh, do report on extensive patient reported outcome uh, questionnaires. And Dr. Uh, Paul and other with Dr. Bergerot have been really um, uh, setting the pace here uh, in this uh, context. I can tell you here, when we look at all uh, the evidence from what is published. And uh, during the GU Cancer Symposium, we've seen uh, a presentation by Dr. Sella on Checkmate 9ER. The patient reported outcome are very important. With nivolumab and ipilimumab, Checkmate 214, Dr. Sella and Mozer, and most recently, the same group, also Dr. Sella and Mozer, presented um, both from Checkmate 214, but now from Checkmate 9ER, extensive patient reported outcome and questionnaire that showed the superiority actually of the combination over single agent uh, sunitinib. And when I say superiority, I mean, this is, you know, a, a summary of multiple patient reported uh, outcomes such as the FKSI, uh, DRS, 19, the time to treatment deterioration, on and on. So I think this is becoming uh, extremely important and I would like you to hopefully to take a peek at the uh, presentation of Dr. Sella out of Checkmate 90 r We had less of these data and convincing quality of life with the combination with pembrolizumab, axitinib, or axitinib, and um, uh, avilumab. And at this time, 
the patient reported outcome of the most recent study um, uh, clear uh, is not yet um, uh, is not yet presented. So that's in a nutshell about this quality of life question. I wanted just a couple of minutes to go through some important trials that Dr. Mozer touched base on. COSMIC 313 is a very important trial to the field. We really uh, thought that there was a revolution when we had single agent PKI in renal cell cancer. I would never have you know, thought I would witness perhaps a triple therapy looking at three targets, CTLA-4, PD-1, as well as VEGFR, knowing that here with cabozentinib, uh, it's more than the VEGF receptor blockade. It's blocking MET, Excel, and multiple other pathways involved with resistance to angiogenics. And therefore, COSMIC-313 is important. I agree with Dr. Mozer here. COSMIC-313 is an ongoing study at the time of this uh, webinar of a triplet of cabozentinib, nivolumab, ipilimumab versus placebo nivolumab, ipilimumab. This is an important study first because it could define the next um, set of uh, trials in terms of triplets. Second, it take a modern control, a contemporary control, a combination arm into consideration. And the third, it addresses a really an important need for patient and focuses on those 70, 80% of patients that have intermediate or poor risk disease. Uh, this trial is um, actively enrolling. The primary endpoint is PFS and secondary endpoint are response rate and OS. And hopefully it will be large enough to answer those uh, questions. Uh, the next study is pedigree. This is a, an alliance led uh, study by Dr. Zhang and uh, uh, myself, which asked the question, how do we integrate TKI, namely here cabozentinib, with immune checkpoint inhibitor. Patients will be um, started on nivolumab and ipilimumab, and then based on their response, and at this time, uh, you know, uh, responses are being evaluated by resist, but soon it will be by uh, immune resist and uh, other criteria. Patients, uh, if they have a CR, they continue nivolumab for a year, if they have progression, reclinical progression, they go on cabozentinib. But normally, if patient, those 70% of patients that do not have a CR, do not have a PD, normally if they're on nivolumab, ipilimumab, they continue maintenance for nivolumab up to progression for two years. I think here there's a lot of uh, investigator discretion. But this study asked the question, if cabozentinib is added, will there be an overall survival benefit? Again, the study is uh, accruing a patient and it's an alliance study. Uh, it's an intergroup uh, study. Um, uh, one thing I wanna mention also is one vexing problem. Uh, now that we see patient living uh, for years with metastatic RCC is brain metastases. We do not have per se brain metastases uh, treatment for many solid tumor and for renal cell uh, cancer. Uh, TKI as single agent activity in brain metastases, especially untreated brain metastases, have not been much successful. Uh, experience from our French colleague, Dr. Flippo and Albigez with single agent nivolumab as part of a large uh, expanded access study in some of the untreated brain metastases also have not been successful. Interesting enough, this is a retrospective uh, study, an international uh, uh, study uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Hirsch um, uh, and with our center, including others, where um, uh, over 69 patients were uh, treated uh, with cabozentinib with brain metastases. Uh, cohort one uh, were in patients that did not have progressing brain uh, metastases, whether with that did have progressing brain metastases, whether with or without radiation, and another uh, cohort that had the brain metastases controlled, mostly with uh, radiation therapy or any localized therapy. And interesting enough, as you can see, high response rate were seen when you look and measure those lesions in the brain, knowing this was a investigator assessment of uh, brain lesion measurement. Uh, you will see a response rate in the 60% uh, range overall. 
So I think despite that this is retrospective, this is quite intriguing data. And I'm very happy that our, again, French colleagues who are interested in these studies, um, you know, and are uh, conducting this phase two study called Cabramet. This is a prospective study of cabozentinib in uh, brain metastases with Dr. Negrier. So this is something really um, interesting to follow on. Will cabozentinib have preferential activities in brain metastases, um, especially in cases where we cannot administer radiation, uh, perhaps to control this, uh, you know, hard to treat disease. And uh, now we're going to move on to, uh, the, you know, Dr. Pal. Uh, Dr. Monty Pal from uh, City of Hope here. And I'm gonna give uh, Monty the stage now to discuss later line option in refractory RCC. Dr. Pal is not one of the rising stars in RC, but actually a superstar in renal cell cancer. And it is uh, my pleasure to introduce him. Monty. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Chueri. I'm very uh, pleased to be here and, and really excellent overview already from uh, yourself and Dr. Mozer. Um, you know, I'm going to tackle a slightly different disease setting, and it's tough because you know we're we're starting to see shifts in frontline therapy, and we're having to move quickly to develop our second and third line algorithms. But hopefully, we'll reflect on some data that addresses that to some extent. Um, you know, I'm going to begin by discussing a study that I was involved with um, called TiVo3. Uh, this was a study that uh, included patients who had advanced clear cell kidney cancer had failed two to three prior regimens, including at least one VEGF receptor TKI, and patients were stratified based on IMDC risk score and the nature of their prior regimen. Patients were randomized to tavazinib at 1.5 milligrams oral daily on a 21-day on, seven-day off cycle versus serafinib at the standard dose. Now, many of you may be well acquainted with the history of tavazinib. There was a uh, a first line study comparing tavazinib and serafinib uh, that Dr. Mozer led, you know, reported several years ago. The study actually was, you know, positive for the primary endpoint of progression free survival. Uh, unfortunately, we did see, you know, uh, some uh, trends in overall survival that were somewhat concerning. And the TiVo3 study was really meant to you know, reconcile what we saw in that frontline trial to some extent. When it comes to the responses observed in TiVo3, what you see here is a clear advantage with tavazinib over serafinib, 18% response rate versus 8% with serafinib. Of course, in this you know, pre-treated setting, we're not seeing a lot of complete responses. And you certainly can see here a fair amount of disease stabilization with tavazinib that adds to the response rate as well. And again, for the primary endpoint of progression-free survival, you can see here a statistically significant advantage uh, with tavazinib over uh, serafinib on the left-hand side. This is progression-free survival and the intention to treat population. You can see some of the numbers there at one year, for instance, 28% on tavazinib or progression-free versus 11% on the serafinib arm. And the overall survival curves there are quite overlapping. Now, that overall survival curve has been the subject of a lot of discussion. You know, initially when we saw the hazard ratio, it was just a tad above one. Uh, with further follow-up though, and, and you can see that tail on the tavazinib progression-free survival curve, what we've seen is a hazard ratio that's stuck just under one at 0 0.97. And we recently reported that in European Urology in a brief update of the study. You know, a lot of uh, individuals have asked, well, you know, is tavazinib, you know, really just a rehash of axitinib? And I think that one thing that we saw this uh, past week at ASCO-GU really sort of addresses that. And this is this abstract that teases out the patients who'd received prior axitinib therapy. I, I won't go through this entire table. It's a relatively busy table, um, but I'll focus your attention on the highlighted row there at the very bottom. And what you can see is that if prior axitinib was rendered um, in a previous setting, you can still see that tavazinib holds an advantage over serafinib. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily appear to be axitinib part due, uh, despite the fact that like axitinib, it has very high spe specificity and potency for VEGF receptors uh, one and two. Now, what about the safety profile? You know, I think here you can again see some parallels to other VEGF-directed therapies that you're already familiar with using in the clinic. 
you know, hypertension rates around 27%. Diarrhea, a bit lower than with serafinib. Fatigue, um, comparable, I would say, to serafinib. Um, but on the whole, and, and I have to tell you from personal experience, having treated a lot of patients on this study, uh, a, a quite well-tolerated drug. Um, you know, I think we're always looking for new options for our patients. And I know between Dr. Chueri and Dr. Mozart and I, we have many patients who are in the you know, sort of heavily refractory setting. This may constitute an option at some point for those individuals. Dr. Mozart gave a very eloquent discussion of some of the frontline data related to lenvatinib and everolimus. Um, as he'd suggested, the, the data really support lenvatinib and pembrolizumab in the frontline setting from the CLEAR study based on that really quite profound overall survival advantage that he'd uh, highlighted there in, in his presentation. Um, and, and that begs the question, of course, people are going to get varied therapies in the frontline setting. Some may receive cabo-nevo, as in my practice. Some may receive lenvatinib and pembro in other practices. And with that diversity of treatments in the frontline setting, you know, surely there's going to be a proportion of individuals who haven't been lenvatinib exposed um, in, in the second and third line setting and beyond. And I think that's really where this data set comes in. Uh, this was what I think is a relatively ambitious study. This was an FDA mandated trial, in fact, um, that I led looking at two different dose levels of lenvatinib with everolimus. This took individuals who were at least treated with one prior VEGF TKI. They could have received prior immunotherapy as well. And it randomized patients to either receive lenvatinib with everolimus, the, the standard dose that I think we're all familiar with in the clinic with 18 milligrams of lenvatinib, five milligrams of everolimus, or lenvatinib at 14 milligrams with everolimus at five milligrams. Now, this is a complicated design, so I'm just going to spend a moment reviewing this. This was a non-inferiority study with the primary endpoint of response rate at week 24. Okay, so response rate at week 24. That was the efficacy endpoint. The safety endpoint that we focused on in this non-inferiority study was the rate of intolerable grade 2 or grade greater than or equal to 3 treatment emergent adverse events that occurred by month 6 on the study. So, you know, again, diving into that endpoint, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. You know, when you look at this data at first blush, uh, you can see that the response rates look to be pretty comparable, right, between lenvatinib at 14 milligrams and lenvatinib at 18 milligrams. You can see there are 32% versus 34%. Um, but when you look to the bottom row over here, you can see that the p-value for non-inferiority was 0.26. So we can't necessarily claim that lenvatinib at 14 milligrams um, is not non-inferior in this particular case uh, to uh, lenvatinib at 18 milligrams. I, I think that you can actually, you know, take a, take a look over here um, at the results for response rate on the whole. And I think maybe this tells a clearer story. I think this is going to emerge as we go through the next two slides. You know, what you can see here is that the response rate associated with lenvatinib at 18 milligrams is 39%, lenvatinib at 14 milligrams, 34%. Um, so a modest distinction there. But what I think that we as clinicians can probably hang our hat on in terms of making a judgment between lenvatinib 18 and lenvatinib 14 are these curves here. So this is progression-free survival on the left and overall survival on the right. And what I would argue, particularly for the curve on the left, is that you can see an advantage with lenvatinib at 18, that's in the blue there, um, maintaining progression-free survival advantage over lenvatinib at 14 milligrams. So, you know, all in all, I would suggest that these data support uh, the use of lenvatinib, again, in this, you know, salvage setting at 18 milligrams over the dose of 14 milligrams. The overall survival curve, I might argue there, you know, also seems to, you know, support the 18 milligram dose, although certainly no statistically significant difference there. Now, how about treatment emergent adverse events? You know, as you look to uh, these two uh, columns over here, you can see that the rates are actually quite similar between lenvatinib at 14 and 18. And I would draw your attention to the uh, table on the right-hand side. You know, and, and as you look there, you can see that in terms of intolerable grade two adverse events, relatively similar between the 14 and 18 milligram dosing. If you look to uh, serious adverse events and, and other uh, treat, grade three, four treatment emergent adverse events, I, I would argue maybe no meaningful distinctions between the two arms there. Um, so all in all, when you weigh in the PFS data and response data that I'd highlighted there, uh, our ultimate conclusion for this was that perhaps we would favor the dose at 18 milligrams that we've uh, become used to and accustomed to in the salvage setting. 
Now, um, at this ASCO GU meeting, uh, you may have seen that we've updated some of this data. Again, response rate similar between the treatment arms as I'd highlighted there, PFS and OS numerically longer in the lenvatinib 18 milligram arm. Efficacy outcomes were generally improved for lenvatinib 18, and that you know really supports our suggestion to move forward with that regimen uh, at the conventional dose in the salvage setting. Uh, one of my former fellows, Chris Bergerow, um, has led the quality of life domains uh, and their assessments within this study. Uh, and what was interesting is that patients who received lenvatinib at 18 milligrams actually had a better health-related quality of life. Uh, and you can see that that's marked by an improvement in symptom severity. The median time to deterioration was also longer amongst those patients at 18 milligrams. And as Dr. Chiguri highlighted, and quality of life is such a critical domain as we look across these therapies for advanced renal cell carcinoma, it's certainly something that we want to factor into the equation and, and just added support for staying with the current dosing of lenvatinib in this setting. So I'm gonna shift gears here and talk about the COSMIC-021 study. Uh, just as context, this is a study that ultimately is gonna bear relevance to a study that I think is of critical importance amongst pretreated patients. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but this is data that Dr. Chueri and I and others presented in an oral session at the ESMO 2020 meeting. Now, this was a trial that took individuals with advanced clear cell renal cell carcinoma, no prior systemic therapy, you know, I think this study is, is of importance because we actually had an opportunity to look at two distinct doses of cabozantinib in combination with the tezolizumab. You can see here highlighted the 40 milligram dose and the 60 milligram dose as well. What I'll point out over here is that it appears as though both uh, cohorts uh, derive benefit from the combination of cabozantinib with the tezolizumab. I would say these waterfall plots are virtually indistinguishable from one another, and it's certainly hard to say whether or not the 60 milligram dose bests the 40 milligram dose or vice versa. And I'd probably make the same argument for the progression-free survival curves that you see over here. It does look as though cabozantinib at 40 milligrams here has a slightly longer progression-free survival at 19 and a half months versus 15 months with cabo at 60 milligrams in combination with the tezolizumab. But you know, I'll point out that our follow-up on that 60 milligram cohort is a bit shorter at this point, and certainly that may uh, be the rationale for our observation there. Uh, when it comes to um, this particular regimen, we also had a very important opportunity to look at the activity of cabozantinib uh, and atezolizumab in the context of non-clear cell kidney cancer. And this was a cohort including approximately 33 patients. 15 of those had papillary disease, seven had chromophobe disease. And here, what I think is a quite respectable healthy response rate of 33%. And this is the waterfall plot that you see within that population here. Again, you know, a fair number of patients who derive significant benefit with substantial tumor reductions. Um, you can see highlighted in the waterfall plot at the very bottom there, the specific histology. So many patients with papillary disease, many with chromophobe disease who derive benefit with this combination. And the swimmer's plot really alludes to the fact that there are many patients who are deriving ongoing benefit from this regimen. So what does this all culminate in and how is this relevant to uh, previously treated disease? Well, this is a study that Dr. Chueri and I are writing called CONTACT3. Uh, and certainly um, for those in the audience, I hope you'll consider referring patients for this trial. This takes patients who have received prior checkpoint inhibitor with either clear cell or non-clear cell histology and randomizes them based on the data you saw previously to the regimen you just saw of cabozantinib at 60 milligrams with the tezolizumab at the conventional dose versus cabozantinib monotherapy. I think this is a critically important study. You know, I, I think what I've seen amongst many of my colleagues in the community is there's a penchant to re-challenge with checkpoint inhibitors in the second and third, fourth line setting. And, you know, frankly, we're just not sure whether or not that really renders any true benefit to our patients. So with that in mind, you know, I think it's again of critical importance that we enroll to studies like this. Now I'm gonna, in the last couple of moments of my discussion here, go over some novel modalities. Uh, and this is really something that Dr. Chueri um, has really driven um, through his work at the Dana-Farber, along with the, you know, just an incredible scientist there. Um, I'm gonna be discussing a HIF-2 inhibitor uh, Belzotethan, or MK6482 in renal cell carcinoma. I think many of you are familiar with the mechanism uh, here of uh, the HIF2 inhibitor, and certainly it bears biological relevance. 90% of patients uh, have sporadic um, uh, with uh, alterations in VHL. 
and loss of VHL results in the constitutive activation of HIF2 alpha. And uh, belzotifin is a, a very potent selective inhibitor of HIF2 alpha. This is uh, some data that Dr. Chueri presented uh, that's been updated at ASCO GU. Um, and this implies really just substantial benefit in potent tumor shrinkage amongst a population of very heavily pretreated patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma with belzotifin monotherapy. You can see here that 69% of patients uh, demonstrated any extent of tumor shrinkage uh, with a uh, response rate of 31%. Uh, amongst those patients with favorable risk, um, and 24% amongst those patients with intermediate or poor risk. Um, disease control rates were quite high with this regimen. Median duration of response wasn't reached in this particular cohort. 77% uh, had a response exceeding six months, so some really, really exciting data related to monotherapy with this agent. Now, again, Dr. Chori is really sort of leading the way with um, belzotifen, and this is an excellent and I think well-justified combination of belzotifen with cabozantinib in patients with advanced clear cell renal cell carcinoma. I'll highlight your attention to the schema here. This includes patients in uh, cohort one with no prior systemic therapy. Cohort two includes those patients that have received prior IO and no more than two prior treatments for advanced and metastatic clear cell kidney cancer. Uh, so bear in mind that this cohort two assessment that you see on the right-hand side entails a relatively heavily pretreated population. About 52% of patients in this cohort had prior first-line therapy and 24 or, you know, patients or 45% actually had prior second-line therapy as well. Uh, so again, this is a group of patients that's uh, received extensive prior therapy with a response rate of 22%. I'll caution that this data is early. You know, one of the phenomena that we're starting to get used to with belzotifin is that you, know, you can actually see um, a, a protracted benefit with this agent and responses may potentially come late. So I wouldn't be surprised if this response rate creeps up over the course of time. And of course, these reflect confirmed responses. I only anticipate this number to go up. I'm gonna highlight here two really critical studies um, that are ongoing right now. One is in the population of patients with perhaps more heavily pretreated disease. These are individuals that have received three or fewer prior systemic regimens, and it's a randomization amongst these individuals to belzotifin versus Averolimus at uh, the standard dose of 10 milligrams daily. Uh, this is a study with co-primary endpoints of progression-free survival and overall survival. And the second study that I think is also of critical importance, this is going to take individuals who have received prior PD-1 or pdl one based therapy and will randomize them to the combination of lenvatinib at 20 milligrams oral daily with belzotifin, and it will compare that to cabozantinib at the dose that we've been used to from uh, the Meteor study at 60 milligrams oral daily. I'm going to wrap up here with just a teaser, something that I and Dr. Chueri and many others are interested in, which is CAR T-cell therapy for advanced kidney cancer. Um, this is a strategy that I've been involved with, uh, and certainly there are others that are emerging. Uh, I'm highlighting here on the left the alginaic CAR T-cell approach. Um, this is the approach in which we're able to use novel modalities such as CRISPR to insert cassettes into these T-cells that may ultimately be reactive against kidney cancer. Autologous approaches are also under investigation. I'll highlight here a study that's underway at our institution and at many others around the country and around the world, in fact, uh, looking at uh, CTX-130, which is a CRISPR-Cas9 engineered T cell directed at CD70, a relatively pervasive target. Patients in the study that have received prior therapy with clear cell differentiation receive CTX-130 following lymphodepleting chemotherapy. The attraction to this is that maybe uh, this could be a, a one and done type of treatment. You never know. Uh, and if that's the case, it might potentially spare our patients, you know, some of the chronic toxicities that they're experiencing with long-term therapy with VEGF TKIs. So a couple of key takeaways from my talk, uh, therapeutic options are expanding by the minute in the refractory setting for advanced renal cell carcinoma. Dr. Chueri and Dr. Mozer are really leading the way with a number of, I think, pivotal trials in this setting that's going to really give us great options. And, and I would guess that if we were to do this program in 2022 or 2023, we'll, we'll kind of know what to do for these patients. We'll have a much better sense of that. Um, and I do believe that clinical trials are the way to go. I've highlighted several here that I think are of critical importance. And if I have one key takeaway, it's that we're just not done yet. We've had great data in the frontline setting, but certainly we all see patients who need second and third line therapy. So let's work to improve their outcomes.
Dr. Chouari. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul here, and uh, for this wonderful overview of uh, therapies in the salvage setting in metastatic RCT and glimpse into the future with novel uh, modalities. So we're going to resume here talking about a couple of uh, cases of metastatic renal cell cancer. Uh, this is a patient with advanced uh, RCC of 65, present with nausea, fatigue, weight loss, and abdominal CT done in the ER show a six centimeter left renal um, mass. The patient undergoes a left radical uh, partial nephrectomy and uh, was followed with uh, serial imaging. Six months later, the patient returned with fatigue, shortness of breath, and uh, they have a diffuse uh, pulmonary uh, metastasis on the chest CT. Now, the initial pathology showed a clear cell, uh, renal cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, so uh, he's seen a medical oncologist who performs actually a biopsy uh, showing that the tumor is indeed clear cell RCC, similar to the nephrectomy that happened six months earlier, and start with a regimen of nivolumab and ipilimumab. The patient responds well with mild side effect um, and experience resolution of the shortness of breath with scans every three months showing a partial response. So what happens with Miss um, um, Olson here? At 12 months, unfortunately, there was... Um, new pulmonary nodule. At that time, the decision was made to switch to uh, cabozentinib. And um, uh, overall, the treatment was tolerated with mild hand-foot skin uh, reaction managed with over-the-counter uh, cream. Uh, around eight months, the patient started having abdominal discomfort and back pain, and imaging showed uh, liver uh, lesions. And the cabozentinib at that time, treated by um, uh, the oncologist, was discontinued. So my question here, uh, quickly, in maybe 30 second, um, you know, answer is to Dr. Uh, Paul. Given the recent data and what you presented, what are Ms. Olson options for next line of therapy, Dr. Paul? Yeah, you know, at this point, I think that with some of the data that uh, I just shown you from uh, the comparative study of lumbatinib at 18 and 14 milligrams, I, I might go with Lenev as, you know, her next line of therapy in this setting. Actually, I, I do not disagree. I think that is, uh, you know, uh, an important uh, option here. Uh, I think re-challenging uh, with IO is also um, reasonable. However, I would argue uh, we do not have data that prospective data that IO after IO is a, a top line uh, option here since most of the study had usually another drug that could explain the response. Now let's say this patient, Dr. Paul, and you've done work in non-clear cell RCC, had papillary renal cell cancer. And uh, what would you do in this uh, setting uh, with papillary RCC as first line then upon progression? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, though. I, thanks, Tony. And this is a great opportunity for me to highlight the data from the SWOG 1500 or PAPMET study, which compared sinitinib to cabozantinib to sabalitinib and crizotinib. And it really suggested a significant benefit with cabozantinib over sinitinib as the control arm. I think cabozantinib at 60 milligrams would probably be my de facto frontline option, although I think this area is want for a further study. No, I agree with you. And I think. Uh... Also, uh, there is, uh, despite cabozentinib have a met activity, you know, there are ongoing uh, effort focusing on the 30, 40% of metastatic papillary patients that have, I would say, a met driven biology because of the receptor being amplified or the ligand being amplified or mutated or um, chromosome seven where met resides is uh, duplicated. And we know from a pure met inhibitor, you can see responses. We had a phase two, uh, savolitinib with you actually, and a randomized trial that cut short with a cruel savoir that we published and presented during the 2020 ASCO meeting, showing responses and showing actually uh, tolerability compared to traditional VEGF TKI. So more uh, to come here with non-clear cell uh, RCC. Hey Monty, one question for you, you and many others, your group have been involved in biomarker studies in metastatic uh, RCC. Today, what do you do in your clinic overall? 
Yeah, you know, I, we tend to be pretty aggressive about getting molecular profiling in our clinic. You know, we started to uh, do comprehensive genomic profiling and uh, uh, beyond that whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq in all of our patients. Now, you may ask, how is that clinically relevant? Um, you know, in the context of clear cell disease, you do run into patients with the occasional TOR pathway alterations. And, you know, that might, for instance, you know, push you towards using a regimen like Lenev, perhaps a little earlier in your treatment sequencing. I find that it's extremely helpful for non-clear cell disease. You know, so if you get sequencing there, we've identified, for instance, a cohort of patients with papillary kidney cancer that we published with ALK alterations that responded beautifully to ALK-directed therapy. Uh, so I think there's a, a big role there. Uh, I think that, you know, and I'm going to try to keep this to 60 seconds, probably could go on for 60 hours, but, you know, blood-based biomarkers are also of great interest. Uh, my fellow Zainab Zengen had an oral presentation at ESMO last year focused on the role of ctDNA using uh, non-ultrasensitive tests. Um, and I, I think that that's certainly something that serves as a supplement to tissue-based testing. But I have to tell you, I think one of the best papers of last year, 2020, was your Nature Medicine paper looking at uh, methylation biomarkers and, and this sort of really ultra-sensitive technique for detecting RCC. I mean, I, I'd love to hear more about that, but I, I just think that's the wave of the future. No, I, I agree with you. I am less inclined about for clinical routine testing for genomic, although we do get it. I haven't acted a lot on it, but I, I do agree with you on um, some of the ALK alteration and others. Um, now, uh, having said so, uh, we have looked, uh, Dr. Mozer and I and others, at the signatures uh, to predict, um, you know, checkpoint inhibitor responses. Again, it's still in the, you know, research domain. I'm not sure how much this is going to be applied, but we are definitely getting closer to something and learning more about the disease. Now, in, in terms of circulating uh, tumor DNA uh, with my uh, collaborator at the farmer, Dr. Matt Friedman and, and others, uh, we were able to find, um, you know, to detect renal cell cancer with a very, very high sensitivity, even in earlier stage disease. So we're trying to take this to the next level, looking at benign kidney masses. We're trying to take that to the next level, looking at potentially uh, minimal residual uh, disease, since we do not have a PSA, like in prostate cancer after surgery. And hopefully, that could one day detect uh, the use of treatment in the adjuvant setting. And since we're talking adjuvant setting, all this talk uh, you know, is about metastatic disease. And we know very well that there are several ongoing studies that many of us here uh, on this call are involved with. Uh, and so I want to shift gears to Dr. Mozer and ask him about some of the ongoing studies in the adjuvant setting. And if something becomes a standard the next couple of years, how's this going to impact the first-line metastatic setting, Bob? Well, I think the, you know, the adjuvant setting is really, it, it's a space that really it, it serves as an unmet need for RCC. Um, for the most part, there, there really aren't effective adjuvant therapies that are available in standard, as standard of care. Um, the mainstay of management is, is surveillance and treatment at time of relapse. And so there was a high degree of uh, interest in adjuvant therapies with the advent of the TKIs when they came into the, uh, our, our clinical arena for setting them for treatment of metastatic disease. And there were five big adjuvant studies that were looked at with TKI versus um, placebo. Uh, only one of those showed a, a, a modest uh, improvement in uh, disease-free survival. That was the S-TRAC trial, which resulted in sunitna being approved in the United States in that setting. But the benefit was really modest. The toxicity was moderate. And for many of us, we, you know, we, we really need to look further to, to better identify adjuvant therapy. So this, this seems like the ideal setting for uh, immunotherapy to be studied and hopefully have shown to be a benefit to be implemented into clinical practice. I agree. And there are, uh, one thing you want to talk about, uh, you know, a bit about the ongoing studies. Well, so the, uh, there's, there are three big, large randomized uh, studies that are either ongoing or have been or have completed an enrollment to address this Question: uh, There was a, a study that looked at uh, atezolizumab, the PDL1 inhibitor, versus placebo. 
that Dr. Powell has been the PI of that completed enrollment, uh, a second large landmark study that Dr. Shuari is the PI on, and that's uh, pembrolizumab versus placebo, and that's completed enrollment as well. And the third big study is, uh, is um, a trial of, uh, of Ibi Nevo versus Nevo versus uh, placebo. That is a 1,300 patient trial. It was initially started as a one-to-one -one randomization of Ipi Nevo versus placebo, but uh, uh, the third arm with Nevo monotherapy was, uh, was um, introduced into the study. And so that study is enrolling uh, very well globally. Uh, it serves as, as the third of these large studies that will address the role of IO therapy uh, in the Ashman setting for our RCC. Very good. I want to give uh, Bob also two other studies, uh, more um, academic. One in the cooperative group that is really near uh, finishing accrual, the PROSPER study, which is interesting. I asked about adjuvant. This study is neoadjuvant followed by adjuvant nivolumab uh, with Dr. Uh, Alaf uh, and previously with Dr. Harshman. And this is an intergroup study we have open and it's accruing, but it needs definitely, uh, it gives the checkpoint inhibitor in neoadjuvant, then followed by adjuvant, which, you know, I think it's interesting because if, if you treat with immune checkpoint inhibitor with a lot of tumor there, a lot of antigen, perhaps your immune response will be, um, you know, better and will translate into a higher clinical benefit. The other study is a, a tree arm study um, uh, out of the UK, called Rampart with Dr. Larkin uh, uh, leading that uses Durvalumab and Tremelumumab, which also I believe is um, uh, accruing also at this uh, point. And hopefully with these studies, we will be able to answer um, you know, important question. If adjuvant becomes, in my opinion, a reality, studies like Dr. what uh, Dr. Paul outlined, the contact three, where uh, it looks at uh, patients uh, and give them a checkpoint inhibitor. But in those patients that were previously experienced checkpoint inhibitor will be very important because one argument that even if you have progressed, uh, your tumor have progressed on adjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, perhaps there is no reason to give it in the metastatic uh, setting. We just don't know the answer to this question. So a lot of thing going, especially with the new targets that we covered. Uh, now, of course, we are here having each one of us mini studio because of this uh, pandemic, one in a century or even in a couple of hundred years. So we cannot escape a talk even in renal cell cancer without mentioning COVID-19. So I want to point out to you of this very nice and uh, also a survey of over 500 patients in 47 states um, done again by Casey Cure about um, RCC care in the era of COVID-19. And, um, uh, you know, that study asked the question on a scale of one to 10, rate your level of anxiety about progressive cancer, COVID-19 and COVID-19 and cancer. And as you can see, uh, COVID-19 really invading our kidney uh, cancer uh, space. And there are patients that rate, uh, you know, and this is, this is a large study, over 500 surveys, that rate their concern about uh, COVID-19 as much as uh, uh, pro as much as progressive cancer. There is also uh, at that time of the study was uh, conducted concern about COVID-19 vaccine, and I want to take this opportunity uh, to tell uh, folks out there that vaccines are safe. There is no COVID-19 vaccine, and no evidence that uh, with being on any therapy, here your vaccine will be completely less effective therapies used in kidney cancer or kidney cancer that are uh, resected. And I will invite you to look at the ASCO, ESMO, NCCN guidelines and other guidelines that support strongly uh, vaccines in uh, COVID-19 vaccines in uh, cancer patients. Uh, now, um, again, uh, digging into uh, the era of COVID-19 and RCC uh, care, 40% uh, of patients were not willing or unsure about getting COVID-19 uh, vaccine and would impact their cancer treatment. Recently, uh, AACR, the American Association of Clinical Research, had a, a total meeting, uh, of course, um, a webinar uh, and a whole online meeting about 
uh, COVID-19 and cancer. And I had the chance to discuss the impact of systemic therapy in Symposium 9 led by Professor Peters here. And uh, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, all the data. And actually, there isn't much there to think that vaccine would be completely ineffective or harmful in cancer patients, even receiving systemic therapy. Currently, the guideline says that in patients that are receiving, that are getting a bone marrow transplant or CAR T cell therapy, Dr. Montipal discussed that, uh, perhaps we should wait the uh, recovery of the count for three months. But we, I would even argue here that when you look at the immunological aspect of response to a vaccine, there's a lot of, um, you know, the, immuno the, the immune system is so complex, there's a lot of things not seen. But one thing for sure is uh, the safety is, uh, established in the larger uh, population here. So in terms of uh, summary, you have seen with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Modzer new approaches in the frontline setting that represent many alternative in patients with advanced RCC. I would not think I would witness that, uh, but uh, we are there and even triplet combination are being planned. There are also still opportunities in the refractory setting including immunotherapy, novel modalities, or single agent PKI. And I think both patient and clinician should weigh any consideration when you choose therapy across the disease continuum, across the IMD series group, and keep the dialogue open to support shared decision making here. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, Bob and Monty, for joining me in this engaging discussion. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully again, we'll be live at some point. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash QEY860. This educational activity is supported by independent medical education grants from Avio Pharmaceuticals, Azi Incorporated, Exelixis Incorporated, and Merck & Company Incorporated.